Short on answers, long on denial. Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo and her inner circle facing allegations of bid rigging and cover up. Is it just politics or genuine corruption? In the nation's capital, a history-making Supreme Court nominee defends her judicial record. Did Republican inquisitors push too hard and too far just to score points with their GOP base? And halfway across the globe, the continuing carnage in Ukraine. Amid a military stalemate and humanitarian crisis, how long will Russia's dictator continue the senseless killing? I'm Greg Grugan and welcome to Watch Your Point where our panelists call it like they see it. Let's greet them. Starting us off, former Houston City Council member, Sue Lovell. Morning. Next up, well-known businessman and columnist, Bill King. In the three spot, lawyer, editor, and conservative commentator, Gary Polland. Batting cleanup, Holly Hansen, political writer for the Texan. And closing us out, longtime super neighborhood leader, Tomorrow Bell. Let's begin. Out of context, one-sided and misleading. That's how Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo described genuinely devastating court affidavits filed by the Texas Rangers in the ongoing investigation of an $11 million bid rigging scheme apparently orchestrated by three members of the judge's inner circle. Facing reporters for the first time since the allegations were made public, Hidalgo appeared to defend the actions of staff, claiming her people were motivated by desire to save lives when they steered the multi-million dollar communication contract to a little known one woman operation with extensive democratic political ties. Judge, you say you're a straight shooter, you say you're a straight shooter and you said from commissioner's court last year that you barely knew who Felicity was. Now, and I'll use another term you use, which is the documents are the documents. The documents from the Texas Rangers show that you did know who she was, you were aware of her activities, and you, and, and you were helping her get the contract. Respond to that. Is that not true? Is that misleading? Is that out of context? Yes, that is misleading. Then tell us that how. out of context, and I'm afraid as much as I would like to, I can't get into how, and eventually all of the facts will be public. According to multiple legal experts, the Ranger affidavits offer what appears to be clear and convincing evidence of misuse of official information and tampering with government documents, both of which are serious criminal offenses. Panel Fox 26 learned this week that Aaron Dunn, one of the key aides implicated, left the judge's staff four days after search warrants were served to take a new job with the Harris County Flood Control District at a significantly higher pay. Coincidence? I'm starting with you tomorrow, Bell. You've been waiting long enough to talk about this. Coincidence? I think not. Listen, <laughs> let me start out with Tennessee Williams. Didn't you notice a powerful and obnoxious odor of mendacity in the commissioner's courtroom? There ain't nothing more powerful than the odor of mendacity. It stank like death. That's the way corruption smelled while I sat there for four hours on Tuesday, signing up as my public citizen right to speak, and she took a break. I was starting with Mo, next was Curly, then Larry. Mo is the one who had the art in there worth over $3 million that he didn't know who it belonged to. I don't know, it like magically appeared from a leprechaun, and it's over there in a souped up, jacked up, pimped up, old <laughs> abandoned uh, equipment room. Now it's gone. And he said, oh, I bought it. I used my campaign money. Okay, Rangers, get on your job. Now let's get to Curly. Just like Greg said, she was like, I don't know who this person is. I don't know what, come on, get real. Look, we know you knew day one. Oh, you have ethics. Oh, your ethics are above questioning. Girl, you can't even spell ethics. Then Larry, Larry, that girl, the lady used to be on his campaign. Look. 
This ain't over. It is not over. This is where the Rangers start. And let me tell you this, only a fool messes with UT in Texas. And I'm a cook. and I'm so proud of y'all. I'm a cook, but baby, you don't mess with UT. They gonna get you. All right, Bill King, you've been digging deeply into this. Uh, what's your take? Well, one thing I think is worth noting is that Dunn is the person in the affidavits who is identified as having talked to the Texas Rangers and told them that he thought that the contacts with uh, Elevate Strategies prior to the RFP being issued was, quote, inappropriate. And so, again, it hardly seems like a coincidence that he suddenly moved out of the uh, county judge's office at, at a, I think, about a $15,000 pay raise, as I recall, from looking at the documents. You know, I, I, when I was watching that press conference, which frankly was just painful, um, and, and by the way, I was so proud of the Houston press corps. I mean, Greg, you were there, but there were also all the other, I mean, everybody was just pushing back in a way that we rarely see the Houston press corps do. So congratulations to all you guys on that. Yes. But I just, I couldn't help but thinking about that Groucho Marx so saw about, are you going to believe me or your lying eyes? I mean, <laughs> the documents are just so patently clear. This was a big rigging from the beginning. Now, exactly what the legal consequences are, I don't know. And look, when, when Lena Hidalgo came out and said she wasn't going to accept campaign contributions, I commended her for that. I, I wrote about it in my column. When she gave back money to a strip club owner, the only person I know to ever do that, you know, I said how great it was. And even though she has her own problems, I thought at least, you know, this is somebody that's trying to be ethical. But this is just awful. I mean, it's just terrible. And, and I just don't know how she ever recovers from the loss of her credibility. All right, Holly Hanson, you've been covering this issue. Uh, what's your take? Well, I, I thought that press conference was really stunning myself. Um, and it was interesting to note, too, that she took time to do that in the middle of a public meeting of the Harris County Commissioner's Court, where, as Tamara mentioned, people were waiting to speak. Uh, there was quite, I think, 306 items on the agenda that day that needed to be gotten through. And as some of us know, those uh, Commissioner's Court meetings uh, stretch out for quite a long time. But this is, you know, this is so concerning. I think, too, if you read through those affidavits, it's, there's not only evidence of bid rigging, as you know, we use it at that term in the, uh, the non-legal term, if you will, uh, but there's also possibly the uh, situation where they created the project for Felicity Pereira. Um, they were. It seemed like they were trying to come up with something to give her, and that I think is even more concerning uh, in some ways. To think that you know we're looking for a way to to favor a friend, uh, and and that's you know that's problematic. I don't know. Like Ronald, Bill said, you know, yeah. What what are the legal consequences? I'm not sure at this point. One hopes there will be some political fallout from all of this. Rico Suave, this could be a Rico case. I'm hey, everybody, we're going to hear from Sue and Gary on this topic, so don't panic, you guys. I know y'all want to talk about it. Coming up, <laughs> the misery of a violated Ukraine continues, along with the deeply inspiring courage of its defenders in the face of Russian brutality. In our Sunday survey, we're asking viewers if they would support U.S. military intervention if Vladimir Putin resorts to chemical weapon attacks against civilian targets. Tell us what you think. Go to fox26houston.com. And as much as it just irks me that I can't respond to that allegation, I have to hold back. And if something comes out, if I learn a new fact that I say, you know what, something was done wrong here, I'll be the first to admit it. Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo with what some would call the old Sergeant Schultz defense, as in, I know nothing. Panel, here's the bottom line. Assuming crimes were committed, and it appears they were, if Hidalgo knew she was complicit, and if somehow she didn't, should her leadership and management be labeled incompetent? I'm starting with you, Gary Pollant. Uh, yes, is the short answer. But here's something interesting. As a lawyer, I, I thought about watching that press conference. If I was her lawyer advising her on, on potentially facing criminal charges, I would advise her not to say anything because anything you say is going to be used against you. But instead, she has this kind of half-baked press conference where she doesn't really answer anything. He isn't hiding the ball. So the other theory is, look, let it all out. So she says she's going to be transparent. She said she's going to be ethical. I don't know what other information they think they've got that's going to show that she is not complicit. 
I mean, that the search warrant, remember, the affidavit was almost 84 pages, okay? There was a lot of work done. And the other thing I've heard from my sources in the DA's office, that's not the first search warrant. There's more warrants coming. Exactly. The rangers are going to be visiting other people and other agencies to get more information. And I believe somebody's talking already to the feds. I mean, to the, to the state. And, and, and I will tell you, Lena Hidalgo is uh, walking dead as a candidate at this point. I don't think it's going away. This is all self-induced. So <laughs> Lovell, your experience with Houston politics runs very deep. You've seen politicians in trouble before. What's going on here? I would say on the day of the Oscars, the Oscar for the worst performance in a press conference would go to Judge Hildago. I mean, who whoever told her to go out there uh, was giving her bad, bad, bad advice. And if she was doing that on her own, it just uh, shows that her decision making is not good, which she's uh, really begun to demonstrate uh, as the judge. I want to go back to uh, to uh, uh, Mr. Dunn, if you remember where he started, he was the consultant on the $20 million hospital that was set up during COVID, uh, oh. advising Judge Hildago. That's where he came in. And then when it didn't work out, oh, guess what? He got a job in the, um, in the judge's office. Yep. So now this happens and he gets to move on to the flood control and make more money. I mean, that, that you talk about something really stink, that, that really stinks. I think Judge Hildago is in a lot of trouble, and um, I think we're gonna, this is gonna be like the hallmark investigation. It'll be the gift that keeps on giving. All right, Bill King, real quickly, what should we be looking for in the next few weeks in this case? Well, I think it'd be interesting to see uh, what additional subpoenas come out. Now, I don't, as far as I know, we don't know exactly how these subpoenas were leaked. That's kind of unusual. And so whether the next one will be or not, but um, if any more subpoenas come out, but frankly, I, uh, I'm kind of like with Gary, my sources at the DA's office indicate that we could be seeing, hearing about some indictments very soon on this. Uh, they may be plea bargains because I don't think there's any doubt that somebody is cooperating with the Rangers and the district attorney's office right now. And something else I want to make sure everybody understands the Texas Rangers cannot come into a county and investigate something like this unless the local DA consents to it. So, uh, so Og had, had, had agreed to the Texas Rangers coming in and doing this. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Coming up, Harris County's Democratic District Attorney calls out commissioners for defunding law enforcement during a crime wave. Reason we are here today is because defunding of law enforcement in Harris County must stop. Harris County District Attorney Kim Ogg demanding from the Democratic majority on commissioner's court $6 million to hire additional prosecutors to attack the massive backlog of criminal cases and lighten the crushing load her current staff is contending with but every single day that we delay, crime victims suffer, and the backlog continues to exacerbate the crime problem on the street because we have so many offenders on bail awaiting trial who are violent, repeat, and predators. Panel Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo and County Administrator Dave Barry claim the DA's office is adequately funded even though Ogg's prosecutors have an average caseload of more than five hundred cases each. Uh, Sue Lovell, you know Kim Ogg really well. I mean, she went out there. She went after him. You go, girl. That's the best of Kim Ogg. She'll step up uh, when needed and go to court, ask for more money. It was ridiculous that uh, not to give her the money and give her more money and ask her for a plan of how she's going to uh, help to move all this through the courts. Uh, that I was Kim at her best, and, and it was the uh, commissioners at their worst. All right, Holly, you cover this and uh, you've written about it. What was your take? Well, those were certainly some fiery moments there in commissioner's court with Kim Ogg. 
It was very interesting. You know, she helped highlight something that a lot of us had not picked up on, but the county seems to have brought in this new budget director from the city of Baltimore, of all places. Uh, and this is the person she, you know, Kim Ogg demonstrated in court that she had never met this person, although he seems to have been the one responsible for kind of quietly zeroing out these budgets for some of her staff. Although uh, the uh, county administrator and Mr. Ramos uh, insists that they have restored that fund. Funding. But uh, yeah, that really drew attention to some of the problems. And she also helped point out that those rollover funds that the county took away from her office and the constable's offices weren't just sitting idly in those uh, departments. They were being used to pay certain staff members that were necessary. The DA's office is overwhelmed and it does seem like to some extent the county is just trying to strangle them financially and keep them from really moving the justice system forward. Gary Polland, uh, down at the courthouse, were you and your fellow attorneys quietly cheering on the DA to try to get yeah. this thing moving? Well, look, absolutely. Look, here's the situation. And the best way to understand it is actually the average felony prosecutor has 700 cases. The average public defender working for the county making more has an average caseload of 100. At the last budget for this the new fiscal year, Kim asked for $10 million more for her office so they could try to get staffed up and reduce the ridiculous caseload. And instead of giving it to her, the three Democrats on County Commissioner's Court, led by Lena Hidalgo, gave it to the public defender, a 50% increase in their budget. So things are out of control. As a defense lawyer, it makes your job really difficult because the prosecutors don't have the time to devote to look at their cases. They're so busy. So it's like triage. They do what they have to do. So. You know, like, for example, we get video in, in a lot of cases. They don't have time to review them. We do. And then we tell them what we see because that's how bad it is. This is out of control. Kim told it like it was. I, I look, I give her all the credit in the world for standing up. But this is part of the sinister plan by the Democrats on Commissioner's Court to force the DA to start decriminalizing certain criminal activity like they did in Dallas. $1,000 and under stealing, not a crime anymore. That's the plan. Tomorrow, take 30 seconds. Get real. Listen, I am so proud that she is finally standing up. I called her out at the PIP meeting that they had in November for not going after Rodney Harder, because I know you can indict a ham sandwich if you want to in Harris County. So I'm glad that she done woke up and see what they're doing. And because it's now being attacked on her people, she's standing up. But more than that, let's get back to the fact that, yes, Lena is the one who did that with her funded. But did you all know that when Isabel Longoria got picked as the elections administrator, on some of the uh, tallies, she was number four out of five. Four out of five. She had the least experience above one person, and that's where they got the it. job. You see, when your goal is to corrupt, the last thing you want to do is help raise up law enforcement. Bill King, close us out on this topic. Yeah, this is one of those rare occasions where an elected official has the courage to put the interest of the public over their political party. And I commend Kim for that tremendously. You know, I met Kim, I don't know, 30 something years ago when she was running Crime Stoppers. I think a lot of people have forgotten she was one of the, I think maybe the first uh, full time executive director of Crime Stopper. She has a real heart for victims. You know, I had lunch with a young man who lost his son to one of these, uh, uh, criminals, career criminals that was out on bail uh, just last Friday. And when you sit down and talk to these victims and see the wreckage of their lives and what it's done to them and the heartbreak and the pain on it. And I think Kim has seen that. And I wish that Rodney and, and Adrian and Lena would go out and talk to some of these victims and they would see how misguided this uh, policy they have on criminal justice is. Uh, they actually talk to the commissioner's court. Uh, they come to court to complain, and Rodney and the others often walk out and don't even yep. listen. All right, I got to tell you, a very powerful Republican privately called her a law and order Democrat. Uh, that's high praise. Yeah. Anyway, still ahead, a Republican contender to lead Harris County says life is getting steadily worse here for too many residents, and she has a plan to reverse the destructive trend. My conversation with Alexandra Del Moral Miller is coming up next. Welcome back. What is clearly a crisis of integrity and public confidence for Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo is just as clearly a major opportunity for her political challengers to make the case for new leadership. 
This week I spoke one-on-one -on -one with Alexandra Del Moral Miller, one of two Republican candidates seeking to oust both Hidalgo and her brand of government. And I'm afraid as much as I would like to, I can't get into how and eventually all of the facts will be public. With Harris County's current leader contending with an integrity crisis born of alleged corruption, those seeking to replace her via the ballot box are making the case for change. Based upon what you see there, do you see indictable offenses? Absolutely. Uh, it's hard to not see that at least somebody's going to jail. Um, and clearly the Texas Rangers thought so too. Aside from the COVID communication bid rigging scandal, top Republican vote getter Alexandra Del Moral Miller believes residents should reject County Judge Lena Hidalgo because the incumbent hasn't delivered fundamental public safety amid an ongoing violent crime wave. So we seem to always have money for uh, what I would call these social priorities. Um, we doubled our public defender's budget, but we just had our Democrat DA begging for $6 million. So when you have a budget over $3 billion and you can't find $6 million uh, for law and order when we now lead the nation in homicides, that's not a revenue problem. Uh, that's a problem with your priorities. And what I'm so scared about is that in mass, our law enforcement's going to walk out. And I think that's very a real possibility if we put another four years of this kind of government. A combat tested bomb disposal expert with degrees from West Point and Harvard, Del Morale Miller contends the badly bungled March 1st primary election provided additional proof of what she calls faulty leadership. Right, and that's placing partisan preferences over competency. So our election administrator is a great example. It wasn't just that they picked uh, an appointed official and took it away from elected officials. It was that they chose someone who had never run an election before, right? What was the competency? What was the skill set? It was political connections. And that's why we were the only county out of 254 that failed to deliver votes in 24 hours, something that we'd done since the 1960s. Del Morrell Miller believes a majority of Harris County residents truly feel their lives have gotten worse, not better, with Hidalgo at the helm of government. She's offering an alternative brand of leadership, one sharpened and refined as a private sector executive. Our county government's budgets doubled in just a few years, uh, and a lot of the good fiscal practices that set us up for the next emergency, those have been thrown out the window. So we don't have emergency funding, we're deficit spending. Those sort of alarm bells uh, are things that we learn uh, to identify very quickly in the oil and gas industry and right the ship. We had a good county government. You know, I'm not trying to reimagine the wheel here. I'm trying to restore us back to where we were just a few years ago, and that's deliver basic services efficiently and effectively. Mueller faces off with Vidal Martinez in the GOP primary runoff for county judge on May 24th. Just ahead, our panel turns to the ongoing bloodshed in Ukraine. As more and more lives are lost, is America doing enough to punish Putin? Killed in action. According to NATO, the Russian military has lost the lives of between seven and 10,000 soldiers in a single month of fighting. As many as 30,000 more have been reported wounded during Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Those numbers are certain to grow as the violent Russian land grab bogs down and a nationwide insurgency inflicts additional damage. Of course, the defenders are also suffering with thousands of their own dead and wounded. Worst of all, an untold number of Ukrainian civilians have been murdered and maimed, mostly by indiscriminate Russian artillery, missile fire and airstrikes. Nearly four million have fled their country. Panel, that grim assessment as we've witnessed little or no movement towards some type of peace. I'm going to start with you, Gary, as you've watched this unfold over the last weeks. What's your take? Well, I, 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 obviously, it's a tremendous tragedy, and it, it's obvious that Putin has uh, misstepped in a big way. But I'm concerned about the dangers, dangers for America and the world, because here's what it could be happening. If you look at the rhetoric from President Biden, Putin is a war criminal. Putin needs this. Putin needs that. It's set, setting up a situation where there's no exit ramp for Putin to, get, to walk away from this, this problem. Then the next thing I read, and I hope it's not true, that Biden has extended the nuclear umbrella of the United States to Ukraine if the Russians use weapons of mass destruction. That's World War III. So my problem is we have a leader in this country who is senile and really doesn't know what he's doing. And at the same time, by the way, he's using Russia to cut a deal with Iran. 
<laughs> the number one state sponsor of terror in the world, and they're going to let them sell their uranium Iran to Russia. And Russia is going to end up making money on all this deal because Russia is the mediator between us and Iran. Think about that. None of this makes any sense because we have an incoherent foreign policy by uh, amateur hour leaders. All right. When I uh, recruited Holly Hansen for our show, I had no idea she had in her portfolio studies knowledge about Russia, but she does. Holly, <laughs> give us your thoughts. All right. Well, all I could do really at this point is echo what Gary said. The foreign policy uh, stage has been just a disaster over the past year. And it, it shows a complete misunderstanding and a very a naive attitude towards Russia and Putin and that whole region of the world. Um, you know, we're talking about deterrence now. Biden's talking about things to deter Putin. They should have been talking about this a year ago. They should have been talking about this in 2014 when Putin invaded Crimea and, uh, and back early in the 1990s when they were, you know, pressuring Ukraine to uh, to trust the U.S. and NATO to protect them and give up uh, their own defenses and then, you know, gave all these signals to Putin that they weren't going to do anything. So now we're in this situation. We've got to figure a way out of it. But as Gary said, some of these statements that Biden is making are not giving uh, Putin that out that uh, he will need in order for him to stop this aggression. All right, time to check in on our Sunday survey. If Putin right. resorts to chemical warfare against civilians, would you support U.S. military intervention? Now, this morning, it's about 75-25 for U.S. intervention if Putin uses chemical weapons. Wow. You can still vote by going to fox26houston.com and click on the poll. Bill King, what's your take on that? Are we in some dangerous territory here of escalation? Well, I think that both, um, I think administrations for a long time have made a mistake of getting uh, Putin uh, too much cover and allowing him to get away with things. And I think it emboldened him. And I think that's true on both sides of the aisle. Um, and I think that I think that the Biden administration did not handle this particularly well up until this crisis. But since this crisis, I have to give them pretty high marks. I think that the the way they used the intelligence, the way they brought Europe along uh, and didn't get way out in front of our allies in Europe was important. And and right now we've got a world almost completely unified against Russia. And you know I wish that Biden wouldn't have made the comment about you know Putin's got to be out of power because all that does is give them propaganda. But he said what is on everybody's mind. This guy's got to go because he's inherently evil and increasingly looking a little bit insane. Okay. So um, I think that I think that you know this is not an easy thing to navigate. But since the crisis started, I give him pretty high marks. All, all right, right, we're gonna and, go the, ahead real quick bromance, tomorrow. The bromance that that Trump had with Putin, I don't even know, Holly, how you could sit there and ignore that. You're gonna talk about 2014. <laughs> Let's talk about oh, that fool thinking that that was his his bro brother in Russia. Tomorrow, hold that thought. Still to come, the historic confirmation hearing of Katanji Brown Jackson. Did the first ever black woman nominated to our nation's highest court rise above the rhetorical landmines of her Republican critics? But up next, our discussion of the crisis in Ukraine continues as Putin's naked aggression triggered the start of another Cold War. Welcome back. NATO's security environment has fundamentally changed for the long haul. Those words from Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg as the alliance doubled troop strength in Eastern Europe as a response to the emerging Russian threat. Filled with what one former prime minister called rational fear of a Putin-led Russia bent on conquest, Finland is now poised to join NATO for the first time. President Joe Biden traveling to Brussels and Poland preaching unity in the global effort to punish Putin's aggression in every way possible short of war. We will have a different future, a brighter future, rooted in democracy and principle, hope and light, of decency and dignity, of freedom and possibilities. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Panel, as you watch the latest developments unfold this week, uh, what was your most significant takeaway? I'm going back to you tomorrow. My most significant takeaway was that some of, I hate to say this, 
some of the 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 the, the way Biden was talking sound so disingenuous. I don't know if I mean I don't know if it was the way he was reading it or whatever. You know, I, I understand what he was trying to do to to, you know, get the support from American people for the things we're doing for Ukraine. If you are not supporting the things that they're doing, it's something wrong with you. Because I mean these people buying their own business and this fool was like, okay, you I, I got a hundred thousand ducks. You got one duck, I want your duck. And you say nothing. This seems so cyclical to the way World War II started because everybody sat there and looked at Hitler. Well, it's just the Jews. Well, it's just the Poland. Well, it's just this. It's just that. That we don't want to be there. And yes, this should have the Ukraine should have been funded long before now, including when President Trump tried to hold up their money, trying to get them to interfere in the election. It should have been done if that's what an ally is. Because I feel you right now. If America is supposed to be your friend, that didn't look like they were their friend then. All right, Sue, I know you prefer to talk about local and domestic issues, but you are raising a lovely granddaughter. And these are serious events. You know, what's been your take this week? Well, I I agree with Bill. I think that Biden uh, has done a very good job in moving with Europe, who has uh, a lot, a lot uh, in this war, a lot at risk in this war. Uh, Is he going to be perfect? No. Is he going to say all the right things? No. Should we learn from uh, past history? Yes, but you can't fix past history. You cannot, you have to go moving forward. Uh, Nobody wants to have another World War III, um, but certainly if they use chemical weapons, that that brings us to some very difficult decisions that we'll have to make and how far are we going to allow him to go before. And all these other nations, when you have a new president, they all poke around and see where they can get, they test them, that's not unusual. Difficult situation, but we've got to move with Europe. We can't just move by ourselves. Holly, I I think I owe you 30 seconds to respond to anything. You've heard the conversation. Oh, my goodness. I'm glad Sue said, you know, we do need to learn from history. And one element that we really need to look at is the way energy policy is played into this situation. Europe was dependent on Russia. They still are dependent on Russia for natural gas and coal. And that, you know, kind of uh, put up this this, uh, myth there that they're going to all clean energy. You can't do that yet. The technology is not there. And now we have the Biden administration turning to Venezuela to get more uh, uh, energy for the United States. That does not make any sense. And it's not showing that they've learned anything from this situation. All right, we're gonna follow that story as well. Up next, another American glass ceiling on the verge of being shattered. The Senate confirmation of Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson is up for discussion on the other side of this break. What my being here, I think, is about, at some level, um, is about the, the progress that we've made in this country in a very short period of time. Senate confirmation hearing this week for the history-making nomination of Ketanji Brown Jackson to the nation's highest court. Some Republicans called Judge Jackson too lenient on those found guilty of sex crimes and child pornography. Others like Texas Senator Ted Cruz challenged uh, Jackson's beliefs on education, including so-called critical race theory. Um, do, do you agree with this book that is being taught with kids that, that babies are racist? Senator, I do not believe that any child should be made to feel as though they are racist or though they are not valued or though they are less than, that they are victims, that they are oppressors. I don't believe in any of that. Panel Friday, Senator Joe Manchin announced his support for Jackson's nomination, which essentially guarantees her confirmation, although we still don't know if any Republicans will cross the partisan divide with their vote. Okay, I see a very smart, uh, poised African-American woman with a lot of strength. Uh, You see the same thing tomorrow? I was very, very, very proud of you, my sister. You did phenomenal. I, I mean it. The, you know, I know Cory Brooker, um, 
you know, the, you, you, you were holding it together so long. And I know that that, you know, brought you to tears to see that it wasn't all idiots in the room and clowns to the left of you and jokers to the right. And I'm so glad. And I am so proud of the, of just your life, the way you've lived it and how they couldn't come with you. I mean, Ted Cruz, he's a jerk. Who Everybody know he's a jerk. Even if, even his friends know he's a jerk. Friends and family. So that, 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 you know, that didn't sweat you one bit. You kept it together. So look, it's about time. I'm praying for you that you be in that black robe real soon. All right, Gary Pollan, were the issues brought up by Republican senators legitimate and did they need to be in this national forum? Uh, I thought the issues were legitimate, but they're not disqualifying. Uh, I mean, that's the bottom line. This this lady is well qualified. She's got a distinguished career. There are some concerns, but we also have a, a left wing president, so he gets to basically under the Constitution pick who he wants. I was concerned she couldn't tell us when life begins, and she couldn't give the definition of a woman. I thought those were pretty like layup questions. And the, and the, the debate about critical race theory is important because she serves on a school board. And the, the, and the Supreme Court could get involved in that, which is an important issue in the country. But that all being said, she's still gonna get confirmed. And to say that she's treated as bad as Kavanaugh was treated, it's not even in the same galaxy. This was really pretty much kid gloves by the Republicans. Uh, I kind of agree with that. Bill King, uh, you know, most people know you also have a law degree, so we're gonna go ahead and tap that expertise as well. I thought she acquitted herself with great dignity and aplomb in the in the hearings. Uh, she reminded me a lot of uh, Justice Barrett's uh, confirmation hearings uh, and the, and her performance there. Um, look, these confirmation hearings have become an embarrassment to the American people. Uh, they're nothing like the dignified way they used to be conducted, where people actually looked at the qualifications. You know, uh, Ted Cruz's performance was just it was just awful. You know, and it, and and but Gary's right. The performance of the Democrats and Kavanaugh's hearing were awful plus 10 of what happened this last time. I'm just sick of our U.S. senators acting like this. You know, both sides are terrible. Please at least dignify the American people with some, you know, a real hearing. All right, Sue Level, you know a little something about busting glass ceilings. Uh, so I'd like to get your take on this. Um, I'm so glad that I am able to see this moment in history and sit with my granddaughter on my lap and explain to her why this is so <clears throat> significant and emotional. She's so well qualified. She did so well. I'm so proud, so proud to have been a part of her getting there. And um, uh, I can't wait to watch uh, the vote and watch her sworn in. All right, we're going to get Holly's take in overtime. Still ahead, there's a brand new contender in the race to lead the city of Houston. My in-depth conversation with former council member Amanda Edwards is coming up. And now there are three. The developing race to be Houston's next mayor has a new entry and its first female candidate. Amanda Edwards is joining a field which already includes State Senator John Whitmire and former Harris County Clerk Chris Hollins. I spoke with a former city council member about what's driving her desire to lead our community into the future. In order for you to really have a sense of what the people in the community need, you have to be present. Amanda Edwards has never seen public service as a pathway to elected office, but rather elected office as a force multiplier for greater service. I'm uh, announcing my candidacy to be the next mayor of Houston in order to do just that. A former city council member. Our residents have had enough stress. And candidate for U.S. Senate, Edwards has spent years proactively walking door to door on hundreds of Houston streets, gauging need, helping where she can, and most of all, listening. In order to lead, I firmly believe you've got to not just elevate and hear the voices of the people, but you've got to really understand and be present in their in their community. So I love to come out in neighborhoods. I didn't, as a city council member, just want to be someone who governed from City Hall. To me, good governance means bringing City Hall to you. An attorney with deep knowledge of public finance, Edwards says her goal, if elected, will be delivery of core fundamentals as a springboard for a Bayou City citizenry 
that's both thriving and united in the future. I don't know anybody who doesn't want economic opportunity. I don't know anybody who doesn't want housing. I don't know anyone who doesn't want good schooling. These are all things that I think we can unite around in terms of fixing the challenges and owning uh, the solutions to that as a community. Within the recently renovated Harvey and freeze damaged home of an elderly Houstonian, the whole ceiling had caved in, whom Edwards um, felt compelled to help. The candidate pledged to close the governmental cracks, so many of her neighbors have fallen through. If we're not reaching out and, and making it less overwhelming for them, then they're not going to get the help that they truly need. And our city cannot survive that way with people being left behind. Up next, is America really ready for a new era of higher times? This week's schedule House vote to legalize marijuana is front and center when we return. It's happening. The House of Representatives is set to vote this week on legislation which would legalize marijuana consumption in America. A similar bill passed back in 2020, but Republicans were in control of the Senate, so it didn't advance. Of course, that's changed, triggering a sharp rally for cannabis-related stock this week on Wall Street. Panel, while it still faces a very long road to President Joe Biden's desk, what do you make of this latest development? Uh, a quick take, Bill King. So you will never meet anybody that's more anti-drug than I am. I think they're one of the great scourges of mankind. I think there's been more misery visited on the human race by the, just about anything else in, in the history. Um, and, and by the way, I include in that alcohol and nicotine when I say drugs. However, it is clear to me that the criminalization of drug use, and especially marijuana, has far more harm than it's done good. This is a case where the cure is worse than the disease. We need to keep working on mitigating the, 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 the uh, effects of drugs, but putting people in jail is not the way to do it. Gary Pollan, with decades uh, practicing in criminal courts, do you agree with Bill? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it should be. I think it could be decriminalized. My concern is like Bill's. I mean, illegal drugs or these kind of drugs are bad, just like prescription drugs if you're not told a doctor to take them are bad. And there's scientific proof that marijuana use by young people is bad for their brain development. So those are all concerns we have to deal with, just like alcohol is bad when teenagers drink and, and, and they should. So it just creates, we solve one problem, but we create new problems. The only positive would be, I anticipate Texas would get a lot of tax revenue out of the legalization of marijuana. Sue, about 20 seconds. I'd have to get your take on this. Sure, I, I think it's time to decriminalize uh, marijuana. Um, look, it's being sold. At least we have more control over it as we did after prohibition with alcohol. And yes, there would be a lot more revenue that could come that we actually could pour back into um, some drug prevention uh, programs. All right, I think we're just about out of time. So I'm gonna say thanks for joining us. The conversation continues on a national level next with Fox News Sunday. And we'll keep talking right here with Watch Your Point Overtime, streaming on fox26houston.com and on our Facebook page. From all of us here, have a safe and healthy week.